Welcome to the Balance Protocol Podcast. If you are looking to regain your health, get the most out of life, or even resolve a chronic disease that has been plaguing you for years, this is the place. During an era where countless people are feeling the weight of ill health and whose heads are spinning due to all the noise and confusion within the info space, Dr. Beck is here to cut through all that noise and misinformation. To bridge the gap between medicine, scientific research, and where everything should truly be centered, within you. Backed with two decades of professional clinical experience, Dr. Beck applies a revolutionary systems biology called functional medicine, utilizing his powerful method called the balance protocol. Here, Dr. Beck will educate you on the root causes of disease, motivate you to take solid corrective actions in your life, and inspire you to reach the highest levels of well-being. He knows that at the end of the day, it is you, the patient, who holds the keys to your ultimate health and well-being. It's time for The Balance Protocol with Dr. Anthony G. Beck. Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Balance Protocol podcast. I am your host, Dr. Anthony G. Beck, and I am excited to be here again today with my good friend, Jeff Ropiers. What's happening, Jeff? What's going on, Dr. Beck? How you doing? Oh, man. Another wonderful day here in Florida. How's Cali? All right. It's awesome as usual. Beautiful nice. day in the neighborhood. Nice, nice, nice. <laughs> well, we've done some uh, work together on some other projects in the realms of health and wellness and fitness. And uh, I think I was able to talk you into coming on here and being on the regular as a uh, as a co-host with me. You come up with all kinds of good insight and research <laughs> and things, all things health and well-being. So I was like, man, I got to recruit that guy to be with me more often, surround myself with awesome people. Cool, man. I appreciate that. I'm a novice compared to you, so I'm learning a ton every single time we have a conversation. So I'm digging it. Right on. <laughs> so we're going to talk a little bit about gluten today. What a what a what a what a little topic, right? Man, I tell you what. I was at the uh, Barnes Noble uh, the other day, or Borders, wherever it is. Oh, Barnes and Noble, and uh, I wanted to show you this picture. It's it's kind of funny. So that on the end shelf there, it's there was a there was a whole shelf that was dedicated to it. That says. How much wheat do you eat? And oh, then, see that. as you can see, there were there were probably twelve different books stacked up there oh, man. Uh, on the corner. So I thought you'd get a kick out of that. Uh, yeah, let me see a, that there. there. Oh yeah. And for for those of you that um, are listening in the podcast, you can actually get the uh, this video uh, vodcast version on uh, dranthonygbeck.com. So if you want to take a look at what we're talking about there. <clears throat> yeah. So there's books: uh, the Gluten Connection, the Grain Brain. Wheat Belly, Wheat Belly Journal, Wheat Belly Cookbook, Gluten Free, Cook and Easy, Wheat Belly 30 Minute uh, oh, or Last time. Cookbook, <laughs> The Healthy Gluten Free Life, Deliciously G Free. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. So what? Uh, I thought we all supposed to be an OG. What's up? We're trying to be G. That's I know OG. <laughs> I said no over gluten. Yeah. So it's uh, OG. I thought was that was good. So what's the what's the scoop on this whole gluten thing? I don't. I'm not sure I quite fully understand it. Um, I hear the buzzword everywhere. Yeah. And you see, you walk down the supermarket aisles and everything's labeled or half the things on the shelf are labeled as gluten-free now. So what? Uh, what's the whole gluten issue about? Well, you know, it, it's become a big topic, <clears throat> but it's nothing really new. And, um, you know, some of my colleagues in the realms of functional medicine that uh, I just absolutely admire um, – Dr. Tom O'Brien and Amy Myers and Mark Hyman and you know just to name a few, but um, th there's a bunch of others. But at, at the end of the day, they they all have um, you know covered a lot of this. So there's there's lots of information out there on the internet about it. <clears throat> there's a fantastic um, gluten summit um, last year and a uh, big program there. A lot of you know people around the world really came together and talked about the subject. Now, when it comes to gluten. Um, what's really important to do is to <clears throat> understand what it actually is to a varying degree. And I don't want to get all techie and sciencey here because, uh, again, you know, myself and, and my dedication and the balance protocol is really to provide people a method to find out what is uh, best for them and how to apply it in their lives, mm -hmm. as opposed to trying to uh, show an, an, an intellectual resume, so to speak. Um, right. So how I define uh, it in a simple terms for people is that uh, gluten is actually a big category. It's kind of like saying automobiles. <clears throat> so um, there are, there are, and I use the terms loosely, 
you know, good and bad and ugly. But at the end of the day, gluten is, is basically a category of proteins that are a mixture of proteins that are found in all grains. And when I say all grains, I mean all grains. Hmm, interesting. So uh, if it's the seed of a grass, it's going to contain a gluten. Now that's what's key to understand is a gluten. Now the one that gets the most public, uh, you know, um, auspice, if you will, and study in, in the realms of science is wheat and mm -hmm. its particular gluten called uh, gliadin. Some people call it gliadin. <clears throat> um, but then, of course, you know, the, most people when they're referring to uh, gluten-free diets and things are going to refer to avoiding uh, wheat, rye, and barley. You know, each mm -hmm. one of those has their own uh, gluten. Um, some people are like, well, <clears throat> well, what about oats? Does it have gluten? And the answer is unequivocally, yes, it does have a gluten. So does corn and so mm -hmm. does rice. Okay, so wow. if, if, if it is the uh, seed of a grain, it has a gluten in it. But not all glutens are the toxic family or classifications of of glutens so does that make sense <clears throat> yeah so this could be uh, like almost all the all the common carbohydrates that people inhale on a daily basis huh 100 <laughs> percent. And, and we're going to get into that hopefully here in a little bit is th that therein lies uh the poison if you will mm -hmm. but you know it, it's important to understand that w terms so when, if somebody you know says hey well do you believe in god and it's like okay well up see well well which god are we you know, is in your mindset versus another person's mindset mm -hmm. there's a difference in there um, you know, do you drive an automobile? Yeah. Okay. Well, that doesn't mean, you know, we're all driving the same car. So they are, you know, dynamically different. <clears throat> so wheat, rye, oats, barley, millet, corn, rice, sorghum, all those guys, they all have a gluten in them. But mm -hmm. what's important to understand is the distinction between the ones that have toxic family of these particular proteins, um, which are kind of comprised into two sub fractions, you know, called prolamines and, uh, and glutalins. So, mm -hmm. Certain uh, prolamines, uh, proteins that are a type of a gluten, right? Like uh, uh, gliadin is the one that's the most studied gluten in the medical literature <clears throat> because as it relates to celiac disease. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it would be correct to say that, you know, all, you know, grains have a gluten, but not all glutens are as harmful and toxic to the body as others. Does that make sense? Yeah, so uh, I know that uh, the book, what is it, Wheat Belly, uh -huh. that's been making the rounds and has yeah, had really, all the really excellent read. Yeah. yeah, so I think he obviously, uh, Doctor Davis, Doctor William Davis, talks about, yeah, uh, you know, the current type of wheat that's that's in production. That uh, that that's actually the one that's bad for you. Yeah, and the, the thing is, is so it, it, it is one of those things where you have to say it would really be irrational to say that gluten is bad for everybody. Right. But it would be it, it would be rational to say that gluten may be bad for anyone with any condition. Does that make sense? Okay. So one of the things is is that it's not just by its default harmful. Uh, because I mean, there are times when it, when it's not there, are, I've, I've seen many patients that it, it, it's, it's not now. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's one of those kind of things to where people get caught up in terms. I oftentimes say that words are clumsy tools. So mm -hmm. as, as you and I choose ours, we're also, you know, people it might afford other people, other questions. Okay. Well, what does this mean? Most of the time people want to know, well, just tell me what I should and should not eat. Well, right. that's, that's important. <laughs> I don't have a magic ball. Actually, I have one sitting here on my desk. It's actually quite fun. Uh, I'll have to show that to you. But, uh, you know, so when people ask, because I, I do consults with, with patients across the country, and they'll ask me a question like that, and I'll go, hmm, is gluten bad? <laughs> so awesome. it's funny. But I still say, well, I don't have a crystal ball, even though I do. But at the end of the day, it comes down to you can't necessarily say. I can give very strong based uh clinical uh, advisory tales and I can mm -hmm. give uh, protocols to determine and suggestions. Uh, oftentimes patients don't like those because they re require giving up something that they might like. They might like <laughs> or, um, that it requires, you know, some funds out of their, their budget in order mm -hmm. to uh, test for it. But we can talk about that a little bit more later. But uh, th the difficulty here is the understanding that gluten does different things to different people. Mm -hmm. um, but we do know that uh, gluten, and when, I, when I'm talking about glutens, I'm talking about all of them, okay? Okay. Gluten 
it has been linked to over 200 known catalog diseases in the human body alone. Wow, that's a lot. It is. So it's basically wherever your um, weak link in your body is going to be, glutens have the potential to cause that weak link to break. So it can manifest mm. in everything from depression to migraines to psoriasis to allergies. And it, I haven't even talked about the bowel stuff yet, right? Wow. Well, so yeah, we, can, we, can, we can go IBS or irritable bowel syndrome, mm -hmm. uh, and we can go to you know intermittent diarrhea, gas, bloating, fullness, distension, uh, borborygmus, and all kinds of fun stuff. Um, but there's all kinds of things. Uh, immunological reactions in the body can manifest in just a variety of things. Uh, it's mm -hmm. been linked, to, of course, to heart disease and schizophrenia. There's just so much. The list goes on and on and on. So that's why I can say it's completely rational that it may be bad for anyone who has a condition. So I know when mm -hmm. I work with patients, it is one of the things that we you know, remove from the diet for a while. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so like what, is, is um, like whenever you're working with the, with a patient who has manifested these symptoms in their body of some sort of disease, whether it's, uh, you know, intestinal or, uh, is it what, well, let's get into some of the other symptoms. So could it be like cause issues with the joints and, uh, that kind of stuff as well? Yep, absolutely. It, it, it could be the, inflammation. Yep. It, well, it, what happens is, and I, probably that's probably what would be a good idea is to to segue into actually what it does and its, okay. its yeah, mechanism let's get of action. Okay. Yeah, more than I'll ask the other yeah, question. But, yeah, because then that's what it'll do. Is then you'll go, oh, well, that could probably cause my arthritis or my mm -hmm. uh, Sjogren's disease or my chronic fatigue syndrome. Yeah, absolutely. So what about like sinus sinus uh, yep. issues and stuff mm -hmm. like that? A lot of people have allergies or whatnot. Yep. So basically, the understanding is is you consume gluten, mm -hmm. and it goes into the, the to the inner tube and your into your GI tract. And some of my colleagues have even gone so far as to say, uh, like uh, uh, Dr. Pisano says that uh, no human can digest gluten. And it causes permeability, permeability in, in everyone. And what I mean by permeability is is your intestinal uh, tract, namely your small intestine, basically has what we can kind of uh, you know refer to as like shag carpet. Okay. So <laughs> yeah. what? Yeah. Right. So it, all these microvilli, and what ends up happening is is if you kind of think of like all my fingers here together, uh, we call your brush border in your intestines. You know. So uh -huh. all of these are stuck together. And what happens is, is all these these little guys here, they are basically it's 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 a, a one cell border on on all all the little tips of these little villi, like little sea anemone. Mm -hmm. And what ends up happening is, is those proteins end up coming in contact with these with these little villi, and they cause an immunological reaction. And over time, what ends up happening is, is they cause the shag carpet to turn into Berber. So they literally be, get, get short to where all the way into what we call, you, you have different, um, uh, Dr. Marsh came up with a classification of, of this basically on you know, level one, two, three, A, B, and C. But the thing is, is, and then you have these what are called tight junctions in between. And so when, when the villi become atrophied or damaged and these junctions open, they it begins to let these larger particles that are designed to come in to actually get into the bloodstream, the circulation. This is what's referred to, if you've heard that term, leaky gut. It begins mm -hmm. to leak. The question is, well, what's causing it to leak? Well, there's multiple things that can do it. One of them can be an allergy to, uh, to, to uh, glutens. Right, mm -hmm. uh, bacteria well, can do it. Virus can do. It. There's a lot of different things that come into play. Remember, we talked about the five causes of disease in the Bounce Protocol, but. Mm -hmm. Basically, that's what happens. It's it's a, it's an immunological reaction. The body, you know, is re begins to release these antibodies to these foreign proteins, which causes a cascade of things to go down into. And, and we can get into that maybe a little bit more in depth as we go. But uh, mm -hmm. suffice it to say, that's that is the the down and dirty of it. These proteins are are putting a stressor on the. Uh, microvilli in the intestines and causing mm -hmm. an immunological reaction, different cytokines to be created, which are pro-inflammatory chemicals and immuno, you know, different immunoglobulin antibodies, IgG, IgA, IgE, and IgM can all be affected. It's what I call it the, uh, 
the immunological game. So I G G A M and E. So pretty cool. It's a lot of initials going on. All right. Well, each one of them, you know, happens at a different time and affects the body in a different way. You know, like if you go and get a skin allergy test where they prick your skin, that's an I G E. That's one that's going to happen in 30, 30 minutes to three hours. Okay. Delayed onset could be three, you know, uh, days. It could be three weeks. It could be sometime later, and that's when wow, we have to that take. Part? Wow. Absolutely. So that's why you huh. can't go and. Well, I had uh, that nice piece of uh, Wonder Bread yesterday and didn't have a problem, mm-hmm. but you know, a week later you can start going. It, it can have a reaction. Right? Wow, interesting. And that's now whenever you're talking about the uh, the little, what do you call the those? shag the- carpet? The shag, whenever if it goes down to the Berber carpet stage, if you remove the the cause of it, will it eventually go back to what the way it's supposed to be? Or absolutely, it certainly can. That's what is okay. so phenomenal about the gastrointestinal system is it is the fastest repairing cells in the body. Really interesting. Yep. So literally, you can eat uh, a bagel in the morning for breakfast. And literally, you know, in, in, it begins to repair immediately. So it usually takes about, you know, two to three days though, right? Mm-hmm. So the key is to understand that it, it turns over very rapidly. So you, you, you torch them <laughs> and they can get better. Now, when I say torch them, it doesn't necessarily mean that they go from shag instantly to Berber. That, that happens mm-hmm. over time, right? But the yeah. junctions opening and closing and that, that that's, that's going to be immediate. Mm-hmm. Produces something we, we can actually track called uh, a chemical called zonulin, which is uh, oh, you know how we can okay. really uh, take a look and see if you do have leaky gut. We can actually kind of get a good quantification of that to a degree. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, so it can repair, Jeff. It absolutely can. The, but here's the key: if you eat toast for breakfast and then it heals up, but then and then it, it bread, you know, sandwich at lunch, and then pasta for dinner, and then you you know what I call rinse, lather, and repeat. Mm-hmm. right day after day it, over time and for some people it could be weeks it could be months some people it's years some people it's decades of this type of you know give and take before something you know finally finds the weak link in the body and manifests in a mm-hmm. disease so if this happens of in those your body creates immunocomplexes this is how you can have the case of mistaken identity where you have these quote unquote autoimmune diseases Okay, so we know gluten can and does affect uh, and manifest diseases like Hashimoto's, thyroiditis, right? Uh, different, mm-hmm. you know, um, thyroid diseases, joints, cardiovascular. It, it can affect, uh, you know, hypertension, the health of the kidneys, the skin. Mm-hmm. Literally, it, it's it's my premise. There's not a system or an organ or tissue in the body that that cannot have harmful effects enacted upon it by the effects of gluten in the body. So now, is this is this something that's an issue for everybody, and the that everybody has some sort of, I guess, quote unquote, sensitivity to gluten, or is that uh, some people have a, or maybe have like a a, a predisposition to it, or um, or in other people it doesn't bother them at all, or is it uh, something? Is it something that's going to affect pretty much everybody, but it just may take longer time for it to manifest in symptoms. Uh, in each person well, yes to all of it <laughs> <laughs> so one big fat you know yes stamp okay um, well and here, here's the thing let, let me kind of get lend a little clarification to it remember like I said is it it's you know it, it, it has the potential or it may be harmful in any condition if you have symptoms of, in other words, in like like for me and in my life and the way I, I I'm free of symptoms. Well, I'm I'm still going to have stress and you know we all have bills to pay and I've got a mm-hmm. uh, a 15 month old baby so sometimes you know <laughs> sleep is not always the best based upon that. But I don't have insomnia, right? But if yep. you have any symptomology, no matter how big or how little, gluten could absolutely be a culprit. I'm not saying it is, but it absolutely can. As a matter of fact, it's uh-huh. so common that it can be. It really is up there at the top of the list of one of the things of the whodunits that you really have to take a look at. Okay, mm-hmm. so it's kind of like a police lineup. You know, I mean, we, you know, if, if perpetrators have done something before, they tend to have a record, right? You know, uh-huh. We tend to do things. Yeah. We're, we're creatures of habit, both good uh-huh. and not so good. So I use that example because it, it absolutely can. But the thing is, is this: you, you don't really have a quantifiable way of knowing. All the time, because the right. thing is, inflammation can be silent. 
right? D disease never sends you a notice in the mail that it's coming. It's not like, mm -hmm. okay, hey, I'm going to show up and I'll see you in three years. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, just, it's like people go, man, all of a sudden I just had started having – you know, uh, you know, blood in my urine, and it turns out I had I have stage four bladder cancer. Well, mm -hmm. Right. So I mean, it, it, it did not happen yesterday. It's a buildup. Right. So a lot of things go unbeknownst to us. Mm -hmm. So keep that in mind that if you don't have symptoms, well, you do have some leeway and some things that you could possibly get away with. Okay, and I use that loosely. But if you do have symptoms, it really behooves you to take into consideration that it could be wheat. Um, it could be oats, it could be rye, it could be barley, it could be a lot of things, you know, mm -hmm. or those in combinations. It could be, um, you know, one or the other. But the, at the end of the day, you, you have to not rest on your laurels that you're symptom-free. But if you do have symptoms, you better put some thought towards a consideration that gluten may be contributing to the overall big picture for you. So what, uh, what kind of symptoms... Uh, would people most commonly have that they should take a step back and look at the their their gluten intake, their wheat, their rice, their oats, sure. barley, etc. What uh, what should they be on the paying attention to? Well, let's kind of go down through. You know, you know, I would kind of say my top five, right? So fatigue. If you mm -hmm. have lethargy and you're like, man, I just don't have enough, you know, giddy up in this, you know, in this horse race I'm running in life. Okay, so mm -hmm. fatigue, pain, okay, so whether it be in the form of a migraine or muscle skeletal pain or a little neuralgia, it could be, you know, dull and achy, it could be sharp and stabbing, so pain. Mm -hmm. um, of course, gastrointestinal, you know, complaints, any, anywhere from, uh, you know, um, severe constipation or uh, bowel irregularity of the consistency of your stool, like I said, gas, bloating, any type of fullness or distension, uh, mm -hmm. any of that kind of, uh, of stuff going on there. The other thing is is mental clarity, you know, memory, recall, um, emotional upheavals or you know, distress that way or depression, that kind of fun stuff, mm -hmm. right? Um, also, so if somebody's it, acting nutty, they should uh, yeah. see how much, much gluten there is. Gluten is unequivocally linked to schizophrenia. So, wow, if, really? Huh, without question. So, matter of fact, I've got some pretty interesting studies that actually, you know, lend towards that. Um, one, one, some of these studies that we actually did was like back in the uh, late '40s, early '50s. They mm -hmm. actually took a blood. They took blood samples of about like 3,000 um, U.S. Air, Air Force airmen. And the reason why, you know, they were these were males primarily because, of course, there weren't a lot of ladies in the Air Force back then. <clears throat> yeah, airmen. Yeah. <laughs> so airmen. Yeah. So. Um, what ends up happening is, is that blood just on, on a fluke, they were able to preserve it and they basically took it out here, you know, in, in, in our recent times. And they actually tested the, the, these blood samples for some of these biomarkers. And then, of course, a lot of these airmen are still in the VA, you know, medical system, mm -hmm. which we, you know, won't get started on that. But uh, <laughs> <That's a whole laughs> it's imagining that sure. we actually kept track of them. But uh, I digress. The thing mm -hmm. is, is they uh, took a look at and were able to do a study to determine how, you know, what, you know, cause of death or health likelihood or something and things of that from them versus, you know, ones that are of the same caliber and health equivalent now in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And they were able to find some very interesting statistics that them and their offspring had hundreds of times, or, you know, more increase in certain diseases like schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. So... Things have changed. There has been um, one of those kind of things that's that has uh, adapted in our genome mm -hmm. to that. So um, back to the original question is, is that it's been tied to a lot of symptoms. Mm -hmm. And so when we see things uh, like card increase in cardiovascular disease uh, and, uh, you know, when it comes to cancers and stuff, we, gluten can absolutely be a culprit to those. Man, it's like a lot. It's uh, <laughs> yeah, like, like you said, over two hundred different diseases. It, 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 it's it's pretty staggering. Now, I, I'm not like some of my colleagues self-proclaimed to be a gluten Nazi. Okay, yep. I'm just not. Like I've said before, I'm a good old country boy from North Carolina, and uh, I'm gonna have me, you know, a piece of, you know, a, a biscuit, right? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna have, you know, some Johnny Cake. We're gonna we're, we're gonna get down on some grains and different things. Okay. Mm -hmm. What about oatmeal and stuff like that? Is that uh, well, something people should look at? I'm, I'm yeah. Irish, so I mean, I love me some yeah. steel cut oats. Some Irish oatmeal yeah. is just phenomenal. Uh -huh. 
there, it, uh, as far as uh, let me get talk about there, just where it pops into my head. You know, the thing about oats is, is that people say, well, there's gluten free oats. Well, it's not the gluten that um, oats don't have a gluten because they do. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and so, just like you know, wheat, like I said, has a gliadin. Um, um, when it comes to uh, oats, they actually have you know theirs, and it's actually called uh, avenin. Okay. So when it comes down to it, it's not of the family that is of the more toxic kind, if you will. But okay. if you have celiac disease, well, you even have to avoid, you know, that type of gluten. But we would distinguish that clarity. Here so later. back, <laughs> so back to that. So the family that probably is the most toxic is related to to wheat. Is that what you said? Wheat, rye, and barley. Okay, wheat, rye, and barley. Okay, yeah, gotcha. Those three. And they're so lovely. They're so tasty, you know? Well, plus, you know, over the years, uh, you know, it was propagated that, you know, wheat bread, don't get, don't go for white bread, always go for, for wheat bread. Yeah. You know, that was the, the healthy choice, sure. so to speak. Well, uh, on the but, continuum, if you will, it does, because, you know, it's, it's a wonder that wonder bread is actually even called a wonder bread. Uh-huh. Uh, it's basically a. You wonder what's in it. Yeah, it doesn't have. It's, it's a non-sugar marshmallow, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. <laughs> it actually turns into sugar, but it's not drug sugar. But oh. the, you know, the the thing about it is, is that um, wheat bread, though it might be whole wheat or any particular whole grain bread, mm-hmm. it, it still has the gluten in it. So it, it, you, yeah, you do get a lot of you know different fibers and the germs and a different nutrient profile and a different level mm-hmm. level of dietary fiber. So it's greater on the continuum. But it's kind of like saying, well, would you rather have rat poop in your soup or a cockroach poop? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you see what I'm saying? You know, a little, little right. bit of drop or a little or a little tic tac. Yep. <laughs> kind of crude. But um, so at the end of the day, you can rationalize. And I'm going to tell you this, though. You know, if we were on like a show like on A&E, like Naked and Afraid or something like that, and somebody gave or Survivor and somebody gave me some soup and there's a cockroach in it, I'd probably eat the cockroach, too. Yeah. But, uh, I'll, you know, <laughs> what if I go down to, you know, yeah. Shea Jeff and uh, they make me a bowl of soup uh, with a cockroach in it, it's, you know. So we'll see what we can whip up the, for you. Yeah, they're going to buy me dinner. But so the thing is, is you, you got to think we, when we start rationalizing things that are known to not be as healthful as they are, that, that's mm-hmm. where things get muddy and we, we lose um, a sense of what's what's actually correct, you know? Okay. All right. So should people avoid uh, wheat bread or what? So what, uh, you know, there's, I guess, gluten sensitivity, gluten intolerant, all these different phrases sure. around it. What, uh, I mean, it can be overwhelming just even having this conversation. My, my head is like going in different directions, thinking about yeah. all the different yeah. things. So what, uh, what does someone who's listening to this podcast, what, what actions do they need to, what do they need to be aware of in their life? Sure. What do they need to pay attention to? What actions do they need to take? What foods should they start removing or avoiding? Right. Well, a gluten allergy, okay, is really considered to be an allergy. So it's an immune-mediated response. A gluten intolerance is really considered to be the inability to tolerate gluten, non-immunologically mediated, okay? So you can have a, a, a reaction to gluten and it not necessarily be immunological. Does that make okay. sense? Yeah. And gluten sensitivity is kind of a mesh of the two. So again, it's, it's a matter of defining terms and to, to give a blanket, you know, statement to cover, you know, the billions of people is very difficult to do. It really is one of those kind of things to where I will make one statement that's kind of universal, though I, I don't speak as the Sith do and speak in absolutes. Mm-hmm. Remember that scene? Yeah. Obi-Wan. But uh, the th- <laughs> I'm a big Star Wars fan. You could probably see, see my Star Wars little, stuff in the back. see yeah. my little Star Wars yeah. stuff at the time. <laughs> All right. So with that, in the absence of an absolute statement, if you have a condition or a symptom, something that's, that's chronically happening to you or an acute reaction to things, you must be considerate that gluten is highly probable as a component in that mess. Okay. okay. So it's a contributing factor yep. of some sort. So right. unless you are you're symptom and disease free, you, you have to consider gluten. That's mm-hmm. really it. Even if you're just uh, feeling tired and and foggy. That's correct. Still pay Something so to it. Yeah. simple. So remember, we mm-hmm. we can't marginalize the poop. 
Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, and it's if, if if you have a Chihuahua and it poops, it's the same thing as if you you have a Great Dane. I mean, yeah. I mean, what, that it just it just is not a good thing. It's, it's poop. It's not not there. Stay there for you. So it, it, it's a crappy situation. Are you but, talking about poop in the soup? Is that what you're well, or or on the carpet? However it works. Okay. You know, I'm a big animal lover, right? <laughs> But the thing is, is it comes down to that. So I do recommend that if you are not at your optimal self, if you do have some, you know, some conditions that have been plaguing you for years, if you have these reoccurring stuff that you can't quite get a hold of and that you might have attributed to something else like post nasal drip, well, maybe it's the sycamore trees or maybe it's the pet dander or all Mm -hmm. these kind of things. Yeah, maybe, but maybe it's gluten. Mm -hmm. So the distinguishing factor is not the symptomology. However, if you do have symptomology, you best consider gluten. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, that's good. So that, that's so really it's something it that everybody to. should look at if they have any sort of, of symptoms of uh, stuff that's chronic. Yep, anymore. give it its due yeah. diligence for sure, okay. and don't yeah. marginalize it. Okay. But then, how do they assess it? Right. That that right. is the yeah. That's the next question. question. Well, again. Conventional medicine today is really designed to do, like we've talked about, the name it, blame it, tame it game. So mm-hmm. they, they really want to truncate things as quickly as they can to a diagnosis and then treat that diagnosis, not the person. So their gold standard is intestinal biopsy. So you can, you can, you can take certain uh, serological uh, tests as far as they're concerned. Um, and we can test for certain um, anti uh, gliadin antibodies and you know transglutamase and things like that. But they will do an intestinal biopsy, which is mm-hmm. interesting to me. <laughs> it's the, why it is because they have to blow up the bowel, send a camera up there, and then take a little poke. Wow. Okay, so they literally that's what a biopsy does. You know, like yep. if you do like a, a muscle biopsy, or you know, if you have a breast tissue, you know, that's mm-hmm. suspected cancer, they do a needle core biopsy. They're basically poke a little chunk out, look under the microscope, and uh, take a look and see what's going on. Yeah, that sounds uncomfortable. It, oh, yeah. It, oh, it, it, I have never had it done, but let me tell you something. <laughs> you know, patients are like, thanks, doc, for sending me for that type of a deal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but the thing about here, – here's the, here's the fallacy of, the, uh, of the, the biopsy, the intestinal biopsy. That, that's like taking, you know, a big old bucket and throwing it into the, the lake – and scooping it out, and if you don't come up with a fish, you go, oh, oh there's no fish. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Your tube is 20 to 25 feet long. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you spread it out surface area, right, we've heard that about, you know, it's it's like the size of a football field, right? Mm-hmm. Well, at the end of the day, you, you, if you can't just look at the tail end or whatever. You, you to, to get a, a biopsy of, of one particular region of the intestine uh, is really not going to happen, and quite frankly, um, it, it's... Even even if that's the case, okay, you can still have um, a positive serology and a negative histology, and still see that particular person have a disease manifest even years later, as pertaining and by influence of, of gluten. <laughs> All right, sim- simplify those terms: serology and histology. So for well, serology is basically in the serum. You know, you could take a look at yep. the, you know we could look at things in the blood, certain chemical yep. you know biomarkers in the blood. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, histology is when you're actually taking a look at something like that under the microscope. Okay, gotcha. You know, to, to make those simplified terms. Yep. Um, get into all the different ologies and pathologies. Yeah. Okay. So you know in other words, looking words. look yeah, taking uh-huh. a biopsy versus taking a look at biomarkers in the blood. Things. Uh, I prefer the, the the markers in the blood because mm-hmm. that's the highway and the markers that go all the way from your your, your pinky you know toe uh, to your your pituitary gland. The, the blood mm-hmm. supplies all of it. I mean, it's everybody on the same bus route. Okay. okay. So we take a look for certain um, immunological you know uh, immunoglobulin you know uh, markers you know, within there and antibodies and we, we were able we were able to do those. I use a fantastic lab called uh, Cyrex Labs. And they have a couple of different what we call arrays, and in these arrays they have um, like 24 different um, you know, antibodies that we'll take a look at when it comes mm-hmm. to these immunoglobulins that we have been able to identify that the body will have these in elevated amounts based upon you know exposure to these particular antibodies specific to the glutens. Does that make sense? So will this so will this test for let let you know whether it's like wheat or uh, oats or like the to that level of like how specific it is and which one yes. is causing the issues. Okay. That's correct. And, and then and, and on that particular note, 
here's one of the things. Remember we were talking about those tight junctions and those little villi? Well, what uh-huh. happens is it's kind of like sneaking into the club, you know, um, or, or wearing a disguise. What ends up happening is, is there's, there's, a, there's something called molecular mimicry where certain proteins of other things – can, can be associated with these bad guys that come in. Like if I happen to just, you know, like, like like some movie where you walk in with the bad guys and all of a sudden they start, you know, robbing the place and everybody saw you come, hey, he came in with those guys too, arrest him, right? Mm-hmm. Well, that's what happens with a lot of other foods, like that people especially start to replace uh, gluten you know, sources like quinoa, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and there, there's, and then there's some um, cross reactivity, is what we actually call it, or molecular mimicry to milk proteins. So yeah, the, the caseins, yeah. right? So um, you, we, we, you want to take a look at you know things all the way from uh, even hemp protein, mm-hmm. right? Um, sesame, instant coffee. There's 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 several ones that the molecule is very similar to these glutens and so the body will have a reaction to those i'll have patients you know will, told me well i went gluten free but i'm still having these things well i guess it wasn't gluten so i'm going to go back mm-hmm. to eating gluten well that's not quite how that works so is that where the lab test comes into play that helps you that's sort it. through all that okay yeah it clarifies the unknown it, yeah. it really does make all the difference in the world to have that who done it insight that last couple of clues to know if it was colonel mustard in the library yeah. with the candlestick you know so, so that really is the the fastest and easiest way to get the the correct data, sure. as opposed to taking the long route of removing yep. stuff from your diet and trial and error and seeing sure. how your body responds and or reacts. Yeah, because okay. listen, all food is a foreign invader. We we have immunoglobulin uh, response to whenever we eat anything. In all of yeah. So there's a certain there's a certain parameter. There's an acceptable you know reference range that happens. It's mm-hmm. what the body does. It's always going. It's like. When you when you have you know doing business in a restaurant, there's always you know somebody up at the front, right? Mm-hmm. And there's somebody at the back. And they're they're vigilant of what's coming in, how we're working on. It. Do we need more wait staff? We more, you can tell I was you know, food and beverage for a while. So oh yeah. Right. <laughs> so use that example. But so again, the body's always vigilant. It's just if they're elevated or not. And but then we also mm-hmm. need to be mindful of things that mimic them or that are similar that can be causing the reaction to it. The other thing is uh, HLA DQ testing. So this is a genetic marker or human lymphocyte antigen. And we've identified a couple like HLA DQ2 and 8 that are um, uh, certainly um, genetic predisposition with those who have celiac disease. Now keep in mind, gluten sensitivity is not disease. Okay. Okay. Gluten sensitivity can cause the disease celiac. Matter of fact, it does cause the disease celiac. Okay. Gluten sensitivity can also call, cause rheumatoid arthritis. It can also cause, you know, depression, or it can it can cause, you know, uh, you know, uh, multiple sclerosis, right? Mm-hmm. All schizophrenia. There's a lot of different diseases that gluten sensitivity can be a, a, a root cause to. Yeah, interesting. Okay. So celiac is is the disease endpoint of a causation from being gluten sensitive. But okay. those who have uh, celiac disease have a preponderance of, of qualification of having this particular HLA DQ genetic code that predisposes them to it. So that's the difference why some people will get celiac disease from, from it being gluten sensitive, whereas some people will not. Interesting. Does that make sense? So now, does, uh, are, is that two separate types of tests to check for that? Or mm-hmm. is that. Okay. Yeah, one's a genetic marker, and we can actually right. do that through, you know, a sample out of your, uh, your, 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 your cheek cells, your vocal cells, a little bit of, you know, you know, swab. like a swab. Yep. Okay. So you're not actually doing like a biopsy. Yeah, don't have to do a biopsy, but I, I do. Rec- <laughs> but they do have to like chew on their their uh, their cheek a little bit and bust those yeah. cells off. So they can take a look at that. Um, but then we have the serological studies, which I was talking about those immunoglobulin antibody arrays. Those will tell us if, if something is silent, uh, and then those are also useful for kind of telling us to the degree of how much our body is reacting. So, mm-hmm. Okay, the the genetic marker is useful in kind of providing you with information to assessing through your own belief, and we need to, we actually really need to talk about that term here in a second. 
um, of how you're going to allow it to be in your consideration of okay. what you're going to do with this information. Because mm -hmm. th there are there are some times when people realize that you go to they'll come to me as a to the, as a as a physician and say, hey, listen, doc, well, should I eat gluten or not? Mm -hmm. And I go, well, that's a good question. <clears throat> and I said, well, based upon what information, if they have symptomology, I'm going to say. Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to adjust your, your eating habits to omit gluten. Mm -hmm. And I mean all of them. And also the... the That's the, pretty tricky. Yep, it, <laughs> it is. Right? Well, this morning I was making, uh, making some breakfast and uh, I was thinking, I think I'm going to have me a breakfast burrito. And right. uh, I knew we were going to have this talk today. And so, like, obviously, we gluten, all that stuff were, were on, my, on my mind. So I looked at the package of, of the, the burritos and uh, the flour tortillas. <laughs> I know, and it right? says, it's crazy. And it, and it says, you know, wheat flour. I was like, well, I can oh, actually, man. I can actually yeah. teach you to make your own tortillas uh -huh. um, with uh, almond flour and chickpea oh, flour. Nice. Yeah. And uh, put them into a, a tortilla press. Little, uh, Sounds pretty good. All oh, the dude, they're phenomenal. They're really tasty. Yeah. I don't know if we're going to have all that trouble, but... <laughs> but... Oh, it's totally worth it, though, because you can make yeah. them in advance. So. Oh, interesting. Because yeah. I'm about the convenience of the patient, too. It's also yeah. living at the speed of life really has to be taken into consideration because, like I've always said, my patients have taught me well. Uh, they've been very succinct in saying, listen, doc, I'm sorry, but that's just not going to work. It's not a reality for me right now, and I right. get that, okay? Um, it's not like the case of a patient with emphysema who still, you know, just is insisting on smoking. Right. All right, so what ends up happening is is when it comes to uh, to eating gluten, if they t if they if they have symptoms, I'm going to want to have them omit that. Not they don't have to necessarily drop cold turkey. I mean, that's one of those kind of things where that's the prowess, the art of medicine is is working with your patient of what they're capable of doing at any particular given point and listening to them and mm -hmm. giving them feedback on in, in methods, protocols on how to get to there. But if, if someone's talking to me and say, hey, listen, well, I'm symptom-free, I do great, all this other kind of stuff, you know, should I admit it because it sounds pretty scary? And again, my question is, I don't know. I can't, you know, crystal ball them. Um, right. Just because they're in the absence of, of um, symptoms doesn't mean they don't have silent inflammation, a mm -hmm. disease lurking in the background. The only way we're going to be able to determine that uh, is through, you know, of course, a, a comprehensive assessment and then, of course, taking a look at some biomarkers that will tell us the things that we're unable to see, hear, or touch and smell and all that kind of fun stuff. Mm -hmm. right? so, so really, really anybody who is uh, who wants to have optimum health should uh, get, get some testing done, some 100%. lab testing done so that they understand what their body is and what's... Uh, what they're predisposed to, you got uh, it. Ge genetically, and, and earlier the better. Maybe have, yeah, yeah. So I mean, so, the thing, we're yeah. we're seeing people in their twenties uh, getting heart disease. Wow, that's crazy. We're we're seeing we're seeing associations of things linked with gluten younger and younger, and it's because they keep screwing up with that dog on genome. I mean, yeah. th these weeds and th these gluten guys, they have they have six times more proteins than than our own genome. Wow. Isn't that crazy? I mean, think yep. for a minute. I mean, you start because again, it's, that's another topic that we could probably just get right to is is what we're eating grains today was not the grains before. Okay, it's been manipulated because remember, you get when you're in business and you 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 started back in the the the, the fifties with the agricultural you know movement saying, hey, listen, I got a great idea. You know, good old his name was Rusty Butts. I'm not I'm not mm -hmm. kidding. He's like, well, listen, we need to start su subsidizing the, this kind of market so we can get international money. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is other countries didn't eat like we did. So we're, we're, we're basically pushing this, you know, dust bowl effect by over, you know, growing the, uh, the, the, the crops to these grains. So they had to say, hey, listen, well, hey, let's fix that. Let's tell everybody they need eight to 12 servings of, of grains a day, half of those of which need to be whole grain. I mean, mm -hmm. what a great technique to force the market, you know, you know, ideas. That's what you need to do. It's completely false. Um, well, I think also at that time they had no idea of the of the consequences that it would have. That's right. On on yeah. people's health, and yeah. also I think that uh, I don't think that they were necessarily doing it out of uh, you know purely profit motives. They were also doing it to you know, solve uh, supply problems in other oh, sure. countries as well, as well as that and get, yeah. you know, more yield from their, their seeds. But uh, now I, here we I, are 40, 50, 60 years later. And yeah, sure. I, I can agree with you know, on that. Now they know the truth of like what, 
what the impact of this is, and uh, but they continue to do right the because same now they're stuff. they're too yeah. deep, right? Yeah. And then you know the corporate interests of things, and you know they want to build uh, you know crops that are you know Roundup ready, you know good old right. Monsanto's Roundup, you know glycophos. So why on earth do we want to eat plants that can survive that thing? Go go yeah. squirt that on your on your fruit tree, your grass, your begonias, your broccoli, anything that you would eat, and you tell me what it does to it. So yeah. if we want to build things and manipulate the genes and create more proteins of things that can withstand the onslaught of that, I think that's really silly. Now, mm-hmm. of course, there's the whole genetically modified organism you know, movement out there. We can actually do a show on that too. It would be fun. Um, but yeah, that's just mm-hmm. it. When you manipulate the genetics of the plants, mm-hmm. so when you, when you manipulate the genetics of plants – but you, you're not. We, we're not manipulating the genetics of the consumer of that. There's a disconnect, mm-hmm. and people we have adapted over over the years to the food sources. So there's this synergistic principle there. This you know symbiotic relationship. Well, science and their you know their 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 Frankenstein you know plants to is what's really goofing things up. We our our, our systems don't know how to deal with them. So it's right. going to be very foreign. It's like dropping you or me off into a foreign country and go, there you go, start a business, you know, open a medical practice here, Doc. Well, I don't speak the language, and now where am I going to get, you know, mm-hmm. supplies and all that fun stuff? Yeah, you have to adapt to the to the culture. That's it. Mm-hmm. So your body needs time to adapt. So this, the genetically modified uh, sources of these, I think, are a contributing factor to it. The fact that they they um, the fact that they spray them with fungicides, pesticides, and even antibiotics, you know, because they want to keep all these bugs down. They literally yeah. spray antibiotics on things. They spray, you know, antifungals. And what happens is, is plants lose um, their ability to do something that they, they normally do. There's actually something um, that I, I've put a lot of time into to looking at, um, the term of what we call hormesis in people. But then in plants, they also have something called xenohormesis so basically plants respond to a struggle in the environment Mm -hmm. matter of fact if you're a a fellow uh, wine enjoyer that's actually what happens the the quality of the grape is going to be determined by its environment by Mm -hmm. you know what what was what's the temperature of that that the, the 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 fruit was bred at the alkalinity or the excuse me the ph of of the soil how much water was there or not Mm -hmm. sometimes they want to induce that trauma so that so the plant goes man we really got to concentrate all this love into this fruit Mm -hmm. and the seeds within it and and the the actual skin of the grape and you'll get a whole nother flavor profile from that when Mm -hmm. you put it into that beautiful art then you know picking which which fungus you want to use which yeast to use so there's flavor i think uh i think even on the whole foods uh, shopping bags they talk about organic fruits that's They've had to fight to to stay alive, pesticide free. So they're actually, um, you know, more a more robust and right. uh, better quality of sure. product. And and again, it's not a matter that they're necessarily more nutrient dense, but you know, uh-huh. the, the premise is is really common sense to where, you know, if plants have had to endure that, they they do things that we just don't know. They were here before us, and they'll be here after us. And again, when we start messing with all that, I think that's where we really started to get into the problems. If you kind of look back into you know um, our history, um, you can see a, a direct correlation with with you know, chronic degenerative disease. Right. When the, you know the cereal started to become you know more into the thing. However, it really takes off on the curve when we started to manipulate that, mm-hmm. mass grow it, get more people consuming more doses of it, and things of that nature. Well, let's talk about also uh, all the different foods, the gluten-free products that you see on the supermarket shelves and stuff like that. Let's do, let's address that real quick. Um, uh, a lot of people, that's you know a big marketing ploy to, you know, they make their cereal gluten-free or or whatnot. Does that make it better for you since it's quote unquote gluten-free? Well, again, gluten-free. Well, who who establishes that labeling record? Well, here, yeah. here check this out. Something can be labeled gluten-free if it has less than 20 parts per million in it. Okay. Okay. So it's just like something can be, you know, we, we get something can be sodium-free with less than 5 milligrams. But it, it, again, it doesn't mean that they are um, 
you know, totally free of it. So that that's a fallacy. Okay. Well, the the thing about it is a couple of things. I'll keep this brief because I know we're going to wind up. But at the, it, the the understanding is is this: if something is labeled gluten free, it doesn't necessarily mean it's gluten free. So there's there's a learning curve there. I think we we could probably you know do a whole other uh, show on that particular topic. But it, it, I think in the continuum, it gets you more to it. But the problem is, is with gluten free is that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be healthful. So, I mean, you're going to end up replacing it with refined other things, you know, baked and, and you know, just reconstituted and mixed in mm -hmm. different stuff. So gluten-free doesn't necessarily mean something is now acceptable in your dietary regimen, you know? Mm -hmm. So what, uh, just real quick, so what are some of the, the common things that people, if they do want to take gluten out of their diet and they want to replace it with something uh, equivalent, what's, what are just a few recommendations? Well, again, you got to be careful with, with certain replacements because remember that cross-reactivity, that molecular yep. mimicry. So what I don't recommend is jumping off of gluten and then just filling your cabinet full of millet and quinoa and gluten-free oats and all that other kind of fun stuff, okay? okay? So substitution is a different thing. Now, when it comes to realistic premise, I think that if we begin to, the first step is, is if you're going to move towards that, is to move towards the, the less allergenic, you know, gluten sources as a step. I think that's a step in the right direction. When it comes to, you know, wheat, rye, and barley, maybe curtain over to, you know, rice, and corn and uh, quinoa and stuff like that. However, there's some genetically modified, you know, versions of those out there. So again, mm -hmm. I would rather, you know, if you when you substitute, don't substitute for an inferior one. If you're in substitution mode, pick the best one that you can get a hold of. Stay away from genetically modified corn and that kind of stuff. Now, again, how do people? Might, how do people know? Like, if it's, I mean, there's no labeling. Uh, well, if it's really. not labeled non-GMO or the non-GMO project, you can pretty much. Lean more towards that it is a GMO. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And that's kind of how that goes. Yeah. Um, it's not an absolute thing, of course, but for the most part, that's kind of what it is. Because in, in, on today's market, people want people to know that it's non-GMO. Well, yeah, except for true. the ones that are making the GMO stuff. They're fighting yeah, that's hard true. Yeah. To, to keep you blind to that choice factor. So that's it's one of now, the things. It's a marketing advantage at the moment, huh? <laughs> exactly, exactly, right? So I, I think that's there. But where you should substitute is into healthful things, you know, vegetables, non-starch vegetables, you know, uh, great sources of, of, uh, of, of animal products, you know, mm -hmm. things of that nature. We can get into a whole other thing of dairy or to not to dairy. But uh, I'm a big fan of uh, nuts and seeds and berries and veggies and wholesome foods that are as close to the way that uh, God and nature made them. And that, that's where you, if you want to substitute, replace that because you're really not going to miss anything by not, you know, consuming uh, all those grains. I, I, and, and quite frankly, I think that's one of the biggest keys that you can actually do is to nourish the body, get, you know, more concentrated sources of nutrient density, fiber richness, and protein-packed hydrated foods. And what ends up happening is, is that's what's going to give your body the satiety that you need. It's going to give you, you know, the, the nutrients that you need, just so much more repair mechanisms. And, of course, mm -hmm. you know, the good bacteria that comes with eating healthful plants and stuff. So um, that's where your substitution should be. So, um, again. So crank up the vegetables. That's it. So in the balance yeah. protocol, that we asked the first R for the two questions. What do I need to add? What do I need to take away? So start weaning, taking away some of those known, um, you know, toxic you know, sources of, of gluten. But, you know, start adding more, you know, chlorophyll into your diet. Mm -hmm. um, cruciferous vegetables and nuts and seeds and, and mm -hmm. healthful foods that you actually have to chew. Right. Yep. All right, cool. I like that. Yeah. So now what about uh, if somebody wants to get get the data about themselves, what, uh, what should they do? How well, do they, yeah, they I, I'd the love to help them. And there's, yeah. there's, there's, there's a lot of data out there already. I'm not the only one out there talking about this particular topic. Um, you need to you know, stick to good quality sources of, you know, from clinicians and stuff that are on the front lines and that can work with you. The, the number one thing is to remember that uh, we, we can give recommendations, but you are a category of one. You're a one of a kind, very unique individual based upon your genetics, your lifestyle, and your environmental inputs. 
there's things that you don't know and I don't know and neither one of us will know unless we get your body to uh, become a, a way to actually be a, a voice for itself. And we can do that through those particular tests that I was talking about that I utilized through uh, Cyrex Lab Arrays to where we can actually take a look uh, with you know, how your body is responding to these particular uh, immunological complexes and also those cross-reactive ones. So all of those are accessible, uh, of course, at, at uh, my website, dranthonygbeck.com. And okay. so those are there. Also, they can uh, contact me uh, and, and uh, submit some questions, and then uh, you can help us uh, sort through that kind of stuff and pick some topics for our uh, future shows, and we can jump more specifically into those things that we didn't quite cover in as in depth as we possibly could on this topic. Man, this is a huge topic. I think that uh, you know, there's so much confusion around it, and people just throw the buzzwords out there. It's, uh, yeah, we could talk for days about this yep. topic in and of itself. But uh, we'll really, to more. simplify the whole thing is. You know, people need to get to know their own personal body uh, and get to know themselves and do the proper testing so that they understand their genetic predisposition to these types of issues as well as things that are happening in their body. Whether they're having uh, mass manifested symptoms or not, they should step if they're, you know, concerned about having optimal health, they should really dig in uh, and get the proper testing done so that they know what uh, what's going on in their own individual body. 100%. Couldn't, couldn't have said it any better. And that's just it, is people really need to recognize that at the end of the day, it's them who are in control of their health, and they hold the keys to be able to get them to those uh, you know, levels of their highest you know, well-being. So mm -hmm. that, that should uh, be the number one premise of it. And, and don't underestimate what symptoms that your body is telling you. We need to pay really close attention. And uh, I know that if they happen chronically, we tend to drown them out, just like parents with our kids to, for us mm -hmm. to survive, right? We, we kind of sometimes <laughs> tune out that crying. But uh, awesome. at the end of the day, you got to be able to recognize when that particular cry is certainly indicative of uh, an owie. And we need yeah. to kind of go when it like that. Mm -hmm. So pretty cool stuff, man. All right, cool, cool, man. Well, thanks for uh, sharing. Anything else you want to say? So no, before that's, we wrap you know, up? the thing is, is you know, I, I, you know, I had a lot of fun doing. It. I hope everybody enjoyed it as much as I did, and it's, it's great to have you on board with me, man. It's going to be a yeah, lot man, of fun. Yeah, man, it's fun. Yeah, I'm learning yeah. a ton. Yeah, it's good <laughs> stuff. So, if you know, if anybody would like to get more information on some of the topics we've talked about, uh, be able to. You know, be able to get some direction in your life of how you can obtain the highest levels of well-being, get to the real root causes of disease, um, and, and learn how you can apply these things in your life. I really encourage you to join the Balance Nation by going over to DrAnthonyGbeck.com. You can also follow me on Facebook.com forward slash DrAnthonyGbeck. And if you would also do me a, a big favor and, of course, subscribe and, and, and share our, our show with as many people as you can, take a, a couple seconds and head over to iTunes and give us a review. I certainly would love you for it. And until next time, let's live life in balance. Wait, don't stop listening yet. Thank you for listening to the Balance Protocol podcast. Be sure to head over to dranthonygbeck.com where you'll find lots of life-changing information that will educate, motivate, and inspire you to your highest levels of well-being. There, you can get access to exclusive content as well as download your 100% free Urgent Health Report. You can also use the contact page to ask your health questions and make requests for topics you would like covered on future podcasts. Until then, let's live life in balance.